Well, welcome everyone to Anxiety Simplified Podcast. I am Joanne Williams, and I am here, or actually we are here, I have a guest today, to share some compelling strategies, some I have used with my clients as a 30-year mental health professional that I have used with success that you can use as well to make your life just a little easier, a little less anxious, and a little bit more confident, simply, but you got to practice. So welcome. And today I have a very special guest, Wayne Shipman. I was going to share his story of homelessness, and I am calling this podcast Pathway Out of Homelessness. We're actually going to have two parts. The first part is more about around Wayne's story, and the second will be more about strategies, solutions, and skills that he's learned that can be passed along to families of homeless, homeless community or even the general public for all of us to gain a little bit of better understanding of what we each can do. So uh, Wayne, I'm I'm gonna tell a little bit about you first that he was raised in a home with physical and psychological abuse during his mother's five marriages. And his experience really of severe emotional problems from early teens all the way into his thirties with turbulent adult years, resulting in several periods of homelessness, and then three years, a period of chronic homelessness. He couldn't keep a job because of mental health issues, and he, but he chose a different path, that he wants to share what he learned for skills and ways that he became a fully functioning, working citizen at this point. So in part two, we'll go more into solutions, but this was more about you, Wayne, and what was your story. So welcome. And so glad to have you here. I am delighted to be here, Joanne. (laughs) It's been a long journey for me. I've I've come this far just to meet you. Absolutely. (laughs) And I believe that. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about this journey and you know, what got you out of it and just start, start wherever you want, wherever you feel comfortable and just tell us well, more. We're all excited to hear. I think, I think all of us can say that we've had some kind of trauma or the new term I've learned recently is adverse childhood experiences, the ACE. Exactly. And I didn't know there was a difference, you know, cause to me, mm-hmm kind of for my teenage years, especially, it was one very long traumatic experience, you know, wasn't so much physical. When I was very young, a little boy, you know, one of my stepfathers, I know you mentioned, you know, my mother had five marriages, and that was by the time I was 12 years old. And so this part of my story, me coming out and talking about this openly, I've done a lot of closing doors behind me in order to get here. Because this stuff that really that I'm open up about, uh, it's stuff that I've really tried to dance around and not bring shame to anyone, you know, in my family or, you know, I don't feel like my mother deserves to be like brought out into the open and shamed about it. But the time has come that my main message is this is more common than we realize, maybe not five marriages. The problem is I thought when I, when I became a young adult and I went into the army, you know, 18 years old, joined the army, I was going to be a patriotic soldier. I kind of thought I had my head on and I thought I knew what the world was about. I thought I knew who my parents were. I thought I knew kind of what was going on. And as I got more into the real adult world, I tell you, I knew almost nothing. You know, most of my child rearing and stuff wasn't really created by, you know, conversations around the dinner table. We didn't have a lot of that. Uh, When we did have dinner and get, you know, family time together, there wasn't really any emotional talking and exchange of like, you know, my parents didn't really check in with me and see how I'm feeling and how I'm doing. And I was pretty much ignored as a child and left out on my own to figure things out. Mm. But the... The biggest challenge that happened for me was I started, I started trying to find my biological dad, you know, when I was a young teenager, maybe 15, 16, I really wanted to know what was going on. 
I was all dead ends, you know. And of course, this was in the very early 80s, no internet, you know. And my mother swore that she didn't know where he was. And she just always, she didn't tell me a whole lot about him or about anything. So as the years went on, she wanted me to be adopted by her most recent husband. And I didn't want to go through with it. I felt awkward. And, you know, to be honest, I really didn't like the guy in that way. He was just, he was just my mom's husband, you know, every, every man in my life, I've always called him by their first name. Well, long story short, since we're crunched for time in the year 1999. So my adoption was finished in two, in, in uh, 1987. So in 1999, I discovered my father and it was just a fluke because I was doing searches online and he had just recently got a new phone number. So it was listed public. So I found him and come to find out he knew all along through the years that my mother was trying to push this adoption and he refused. He wouldn't sign. And at one time she actually had me write a letter to a judge and deliberately manipulated me and my father into this adoption process. And a long story short, I mean, this is how manipulating it was. It was pretty terrible but, later on to figure out that this but, was a trick. And but what? what did that do to you emotionally or mentally it, that you feel like it this ruined manipulation me? I, I became was... I became a walking, talking, angry, foul mouthed, yeah. resentful, hatred young man. Yeah, I bet. I mean, the, the whole story of, you know, all of the, all of the stepfathers and how much we moved around and we became a military family. And, and the last husband, we went to Germany. So we were all, me and my sister were pretty much stuck in Germany in a family we didn't like to be in. But in my mind, um, later in the years, as I started really kind of freelance traveling around in America, I just, I got so burned out on trying to be like everybody else and be normal. And, fit and in. I just kind of started, yes, to fit in. And I was really on an identity search. I was yeah. really struggling with who I was as a person yes. and come to find out I was, I was suffering from some really serious hardcore mental disorders that I really didn't know what they were. I knew I was angry. I knew I had a lot of depression and probably, well, from the summer of ninth grade is when I first got turned on to smoking pot. And so I became kind of the flower child hippie. I had very long hair, you know, going through 10th grade and 11th grade, I would just sit in class and fluff my hair and stuff. And, and, but I didn't have any philosophy. Most of the kids in 10th and 11th grade, they were already taking the ASVAB test and they were already like planning what they're going to be doing everybody kept asking me, Wayne, what are you going to do? You know, we're going to be out of school pretty soon. And I was just like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't care to be honest with you. I didn't care. And so that That's became my does. personality trait was yeah. I didn't care. So I didn't care about learning. I didn't care about education. I didn't care about jobs. I didn't care about any of that adult responsibility. Well, then one girlfriend I met got pregnant. And suddenly I started trying to care. <laughs> 1988, my first baby was about to be born. And that was the major shift for me as an adult was like, it was more like, oh my God, this is real. You know, like you can't just pick and choose like what responsibilities you're going to take. I can't just use that anymore. I can't just say, well, I don't feel like working. I'm just not going to work. It's like, oh my God, I'm having a baby. Well, Three or four years later, I had three children all together, two different mothers. But the children, having children, struck me very seriously as it's time to wake up. Like, it's time to actually have a shift now, not later, now. Like, it's kind of too late, but I have to do it now. And that struggle began. That's when my, my mild kind of anger management problems turned into real bipolar anger and my constant nagging depression feelings turned into real bipolar depression. I was diagnosed with those probably in 19 or 2008. I went through some really serious uh, self-initiated 
um, psychological exams and psychological profiling. I went to a doctor and had blood work and she set me up with a psychiatrist. And I mean, I went through several weeks of counseling and questioning. And so what I found out was, you know, I had several things going on. You know, my mind was completely disturbed and I had the, I had a very serious victim mentality because I didn't understand. I didn't understand anything. So of course, you know, it's can not I, really ask, what it wasn't my fault. Can I, sure. can I ask you a question about this? Because it sounds to me like that victim mentality and the depression um, also sounds like post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm just wondering, did anybody talk about that? Because that makes you be anxious and depressed. And sometimes it throws you back and forth. And a lot of times the depression and that giving up, did they talk, anybody talk to you about your trauma that you experienced as a child? They did, but, you know, I'm trying to walk on eggshells here. It's not because I'm shy to talk about my own experiences, but what I've learned, probably what you know as an expert, you can use different explanations and we can call it PTSD or we can put a label on it, but that doesn't describe the emotion or the, the experience of what it was for me. Uh, PTSD. Yeah. I, you know, my, the stepfather that really whipped me a lot and cussed a lot and punched walls and broke things. And that was traumatic for me as a little boy, because I just had to witness that all the time. But it wasn't just him. It was him and my mother. My mother was throwing plates across the room and breaking windows. And she was just as violent as he was kind of in her own defense. But me and my sister was just in the room watching this. But over time, I think the PTSD set in as the, the problem was I never had skills or tools to process those things that I was, that I was experiencing. And even later as an adult, you know, I was 34 years old when they finally diagnosed me with some of these things. And it gave me a target when they actually started telling me, you know, this is what we have to deal with here. I was able to go back to my apartment and just look things up online and say, oh, wow, that's what post-traumatic stress, you know, and PTSD used to be limited. It used to be kind of a coined phrase for soldiers in combat. But now we're realizing, you know, it's Anything children following a trauma is it's, PTSD. It's children witnessing things that they don't know what's going on and can't understand and figure out why this is going on. And they can feel yeah. threatened themselves or watching their mother or, you know, somebody they love being threatened. And so it does something in our brain for protection and going yeah. into protect mode and survival mode all the time. I mean, like you're saying, without the skills. So how did this go into homelessness? At, at what age was this that that turned? My homelessness was more of a result of my rebellion of adult, of adult responsibilities at ah, first. Okay. I tried my absolute best as a human being to be a father. Yeah. I tried my best to be a husband. I tried to be the breadwinner. I was working two jobs, sometimes two jobs, plus some hustles under the table, and I couldn't bring it. And my family was... Even when we were working, me and my wife would both have a job. We were just paying most of the money in daycare anyway. It was just bleeding us out. And so our, our marriage was suffering. My toxic, my toxic personality was just unbearable. Uh, it Again, wasn't my but, wife. But just like and, you said, you know, without the skills, without knowing how. And what yeah. to do. It's hard to blame yourself, your wife, your children, or anyone, because you just didn't have what you needed to make this work. I'd like and to make this, struggling. I'd like to make, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to make this point that we go through the blame cycle for a long time. And when we finally get to the other side, we take responsibility. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. for me, Part of my message to every homeless person is there comes a time when we just have to admit in order to move on and move past it, we just have to accept it. And my other part is I can forgive my mother. She's a human being. I can forgive the man that was beating me. I can forgive them all because they're human. 
there's certain things that I'm just going to carry with me as my right, as my own, you know, I remember the suffrage they caused on me. So therefore, there's a lot I sacrificed in my life without the skills I should have had. But when I took responsibility, it no longer mattered who caused it. And it no, it no longer mattered why it happened. Yeah. So when I took responsibility in that, in that way, yeah. my mind shifted from who did this to me and why did it happen to, okay, what do I have to do to turn this around? And I'm going to add and another so, one I hear all the time. The woe is me. You know, I, you know, I'm the victim here and they did this to me and I, I, you know, I'm helpless. And you're saying there's another side, I always call it two sides of a coin. Blame is on one side, but responsibility is on the other. And what made you shift into more responsible behavior? Because it sounds like you were felt, must have felt kind of defeated that you went into the homeless kind of way of life, but something shifted it for you. You know, there was uh, the universe has a funny way of bringing you to where you need to be to receive something, (laughs) right? Yes. And we've all heard, you know, you have to hit rock bottom for some of us. I mean, maybe you didn't, but for some of us, rock bottom is a very dark, very long tunnel. And, you know, in my case, being homeless, it wasn't homeless that had me ashamed. I was, unfortunately, I was in Portland, Oregon, and I was, I was hanging out with the hippies and the drummers and the fire dancing chicks. You know, I was having a great time for a while. But when I realized my children didn't see it like that, every time I talked to them on the phone, it was like a three minute conversation. They were ashamed of me in a way that demoralized me. Okay. Because I thought, you know, they're with a military family. She's remarried. They don't need anything from me. They thought their dad is a homeless man and whatever they see on TV and in the movies, that's what they thought. So they thought I was this kind of ugly guy with whiskers pushing a shopping cart, you know, which I never did. But when I felt so demoralized comparing myself to the patriotic young man that I once was, Mm -hmm. and that got stuck in my mind, I was like, my God, you know, I'm 37 years old and I'm out here, like for crying out loud, how did I get here? And it started out just kind of a trip and just a party for a little while, but I actually got stuck out there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the three-year period, I was in and out of hotels and apartments, and I would get a job, but in two weeks or a month, I'd lose it again. I was back out there. I went into some, you know, some hardcore drug stuff. To be honest with you, the big turnaround for me, I'm just going to skip to it. I, I got hungry. You know, I realized one day that hunger is a really serious motivation. When you're hungry and your stomach is hurting with pain, you will find something to eat. Even if you're going to eat the bark of the trees, it doesn't matter. You got to eat, right? Well, I became that hungry for knowledge. I wanted skills. I wanted someone to help. Don't just label me with bipolar and PTSD. I want to know how to deal with this. And of course, almost everybody I talked to, every counselor and doctor I went to, they had a list of preferred medications, you know, based on these symptoms. And I rejected them all, Joanne. Uh, at the time, though, I was telling my doctors, I said, your pills can't do any, you know, what my marijuana can do. I mean, I can go outside and smoke and within four seconds, I'm smiling, I'm happy. And then, you know, the doctor made a comment one day that really stuck in my head. And this is what caused me to actually make the switch. She said, you either have to live with your symptoms or you need to take these medications so you can manage your moods. And I said, well, what's the middle ground? What's yeah. about the skills? Yeah, I was going to say, how about what, learning what, to manage the symptoms? What about that? You know, well, how, why, am I, why am I the one that can't walk around and be like normal people? Like, why are you telling me that? She says, well, in my professional opinion, you know, anyone with bipolar or anything hasn't learned to manage their skills without some medications. And I said, well, how long does this have to go on? She goes, as long as you have symptoms. And for you, it's your, your brain is a bipolar brain. And so anyway, we went into that the very next day. Okay. I was working through labor ready most of the time, making some money, uh, you know, and I loved going to Goodwill and it's kind of the old yard sale guy in me. I love just picking through stuff. 
I found a Tony Robbins cassette tape program and it was the personal power Two program. And this thing was in this great big, real thick thing. And it was 30 cassette tapes, you know, well, I had like 18 bucks on me and I took this up there to the clerk and I said, I really need this. Like this guy looks like he's like really important and he's got all these programs and I see the labels and she goes, no, the guy, the guy said, we don't bargain prices. I mean, it's, it's priced. And I said, I got to have this. I got to have this. You don't understand my problem. I'm homeless and I got to learn this. She said, uh, the guy said he would hold it for 24 hours. The next morning I was at labor ready at like five 30 in the morning, like my record time. I made it there. I found a way to get there. I worked for the day. I made it back and I got my program. You know, I had one of those great big Walkmans from like the 80s and I had them funny headphones. I stuck Tony Robbins in there for the first time. I, I'm getting kind of some soul chills right now. I am too. <laughs> but this is, this is what it takes though. I mean, you know, I was walking around with my disturbed voice in my own head. And at that point in my life, I had these whiskers that were so ugly and my hair was like three inches underneath my hat just sticking out. I realized later on, you might run into this with some of your clients, and this will give you a clue. It wasn't the razor and shaving. I didn't hate shaving. That's what I thought. What I hated was seeing myself in the mirror while I was shaving. I had to look myself in the eyes. And you know what, Joanne, there was just lifeless eyes looking back at me in the mirror. And that was me. And I finally realized for the first time, if the eyes are the window to the soul, I'm still in there somewhere. Yep. Right. Good. That's what turned me on. I said, you know what? If it's true that the eyes are the windows to the soul and I see myself, I'm only seeing this image of myself, but I'm still in there. I'm going to find this guy. And I started listening to that Tony Robbins and not only Tony Robbins. I mean, he's not the savior of the world, but. Tony Robbins is a lightning rod of motivation and optimism. Yes. And at that time that you might as well have been talking Chinese to me. And in fact, I've got a notebook to this day that I carried in my backpack. My vocabulary was so terrible when I was living out wood in the woods, in the wilderness as a homeless guy, I couldn't remember. I sat down with a pen and I tried to write down positive words. I got like nine positive words on a list and that's all I could think of. That's how angry and disturbed I was. And Tony Robbins, within an hour, I was saying things like, you know, just wild, crazy, optimistic phrases was coming out of my mouth. And I'm like, I was walking around listening to the headset, just talking out loud. Tony says I can make it. Tony Robbins says I can turn my life around. Tony Robbins is this guy. I'm going to listen to him. And yeah, that's where I was. And I got fired up, excited. And that's what it takes. That's what it, it takes. And it sounds like it worked for you. You know, it didn't take mm -hmm. three years of therapy or it didn't take three months of something else. It's like, it was pretty instantaneous for you. There, there was something in that message that resonated with you that gave you that possibility. You can do it. And that, so that is what, is what turned you around. And so tell yeah. us about your life now or since that turned you around. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> I was also that guy. This was in 2007 when I discovered Tony Robbins. Okay. At that time also, I had a fascination with bookstores and in Portland, there's bookstores <laughs> everywhere, just like coffee shops, you know, yeah, there's Powell's. bookstores everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and Powell's books, you know, and I used to love going in there and I would buy myself, I'd pay the three bucks for the coffee. I didn't care. It was great coffee. And I would stroll around in there and pick out books and just sit down. They had tables. You could sit down and read and you didn't have to buy the books. And I was over there with my little cell phone. I was taking pictures of the pages and there was like a list of one to 10. These things were like name off some of the goals you want for the future. And I would sit there and drink my cup to the bottom. And I couldn't think of a goal for the future because right. I didn't think I could do anything with my future. The thing about Tony Robbins and most, I'm sure you specialize in finding the message. It's not the golden carrot we're chasing after it's self-worth. I wanted to feel like I could be 
someone with a voice that mattered. And I just wanted to know, I wanted my children to find out I became a respectable person. That's when I wrote down my goals, I wrote down the word respectable. And that word, when I looked at it on the paper, it almost made me mad. I went outside and had a cigarette and I was like, "Ah, that means I got to be nice to people. And that means I got to learn like this new vocabulary and like, God, I just hate, you know, I hated myself so bad. I just being respectable was like out of the question. I was, you, I ain't going to respect you. You know, what are you done for me? Okay. So today this is 2021. That's what 14 years to be honest with your audience. Still to this day, I do still have bipolar triggers. They happen. And from what I understand, when we have real disorders in the mind, it's real, okay? And positive attitude ointment sometimes just doesn't fix that. But what I've learned is skills so that when something comes out of my mouth, I'm able to kind of grab it right away instead of letting it get out of control like a, you know, a fireball. But you know, I'm a semi-truck driver right now, and I go all over the country. So that's a testimony kind of by itself because you can't just go out and get a semi-truck driving job. There is so there's serious background checks. If you had any drug violations, any alcohol related driving violations, anything like that, even certain terminations, you know, getting fired for a bad attitude, they ain't going to have you behind the wheel. And I got to add, but I think of the responsible behavior you have to have to be in, I don't know how much that thing weighs or more or less how much that yeah. big truck costs, but you got a lot of responsibility, you know, that you are it's, it's pretty, for. yeah, it's intense. And so in that respect, I, I know we don't have much time, but in that respect, what I've developed in the last 14 years now is literally a new lifestyle. This, the the solution to our worst problems is recreating our habits and recreating our lifestyle. Uh, Instead of waking up in the morning, dreading the day and just like thinking of the mental list of everything that I have to do. And I hate to do, I wake up in the morning and the very first thing I try to do is start saying things that are optimistic. And sometimes that hurts, you know, it ain't an optimistic day sometimes, you know, but so the lifestyle change is I have to deliberately monitor my thoughts and I have to watch my mouth and I have to be courteous to other people and I have to actually want this. Okay. I have to want this. It's a choice in my life. It It is, but it's a choice. We have to reinforce Not only every day, you don't just wake up in the morning and decide this is all all day long. Our choices are momentary choices all day long. And so I see homeless people all over the place. And I see the look on their face of dread, loneliness. They're forgotten. They're isolated. And, you know, in part two, we'll talk more about how COVID has brought this change on us. But I get so excited. I get so excited. I, I sometimes I'm sitting at a stoplight and there's a guy over there just like mad and he's smoking a cigarette and the, the cars won't stop and he can't get by and you can see him over there just mad. I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy. And that guy ain't in me no more. It's not like I've learned to control my habits to where I control my moods. That's not it. I've experienced the shift in personality where I have actually overcome and I've outgrown the man I used to be. Yeah, it, I call it, it doesn't serve you anymore. And it you doesn't, have, it, it, it fell off. You've grown, yeah, you've grown past it. Yeah. You know, one thing I'd like to say to the audience that I am hearing from your story as we kind of wrap this up, Wayne, is that I see self-worth and coming first and, and even self-love or purpose comes from the outside first, from our family members. They're the ones that show us that you're an important part of this family. You mean so much to us. That's the way I'll call it supposed to, but, and I put air quotes around it in the sense that a way of functioning development happens with a child. 
it really truly is meant to come from the outside. But what I'm hearing in your story, and it's in my life too, but you can go back to my first podcast and hear my sad sack story as well, but that I didn't get it either. But I did it by but pretty much the way you did deciding I don't choose that anymore. I want these wonderful things in my life and I'm choosing something different, but I had to give them to myself. There was nobody there to give it to me. Nope. And, nope. and, you know, and we call that kind of a struggle and like, maybe it's not good or something. You're self-centered, you know you're self-centered. <laughs> Yeah, or they call it a bad word or selfish. But I'm telling you, you got to learn the skills and do it yourself. And I just want to make another comment. You know, this background, this is not my usual background that you'll see in my podcast. And one of the reasons why I wanted to keep it up today is because (laughs) I thought this was so apropos. I'm doing a a Roku series, four series on um, success killers or how to create your version of success. And, you know, oh, this man. is kind I want to be my... in your class. <laughs> well, it's going to be on TV. It's going to be for, you know, shows. Mm. But, you know, this is like, is this your version of success? This beautiful picture behind me? Or we all have a different picture. But, you know, you're you to me, and but you have to define it. Are you living what you consider a successful life? And we can always do something different, but I want people to not compare or judge somebody else for the way they are living and seeing it as right or wrong. But in in ourselves, how do we feel as we get up every morning and say, yes, instead of, oh, no. So I just wanted you to hear I'm seeing your version of success <laughs> here. And I, and, you know, and I think that's why I really wanted my audience to hear your story, that this isn't all about the poor me and the poor homeless. It is about a version of some, or a place card <laughs> in somebody's life, but it doesn't mean they're there forever or that they're, that they're going to be there forever. They're in a place in time and that we all can make a difference in that. And that's what we want to talk more about it in part two. But before we yeah. go on, Wayne, I'd love for you to just kind of sum this up or tell us some last thoughts that you might want our listeners to hear from you. And then I would love for you to tell us how would they find you? Well, I'm kind of the extreme version. Not everyone's gonna, not everyone's gonna have the kind of the, the toughness to go as far as I've come. Okay. I'll just say that. And I'm not patting myself. What I'm saying is the adult reality of the world we live in is tough. It's harsh. Okay. Uh, To the extreme, when you said, you know, what is my version of success? I just for material trappings, me and my wife recently purchased a home. So I'm now a homeowner, which is exciting. And it sucks because yeah. I can't just take time off work if I want to, because now I have a $1,200 mortgage. Okay. And responsibility. But I mean, I was, <laughs> I've got, yeah. So I was in a tent in the woods not long ago in perspective, and I had a rope tied up in this tree. And I didn't tie it up there to commit suicide, but I was looking, I was very, very seriously contemplating going ahead with it because it wasn't my life in the past that was so dreadful. I wanted to kill myself. It was the life in the future. If I'm going to be this guy and this is going to be my experience, I don't want to be here. I don't want to see the future. So I had this rope up in the tree because rats and stuff kept getting into my backpack and my food. And I'd hang my backpack up there. One morning I saw this rope hanging in the, it was just, it was just hanging there doing like this. And like the light went on and I'm like, geez, it would be so easy. Nobody even really knows where I am. I hardly knew where I was like on the map. I knew I was somewhere in the woods. You know what stopped me? I didn't want that to be the end of my story. I knew my children would eventually find out and they would be, they would say, I told you. He's a worthless, useless, homeless guy out in the woods, and he killed himself. He's a wimp. 
I wanted my story to be, even if they never talked to me again, they would find out I did become that respectable person. That thing I wrote down the first day I listened to Tony Robbins, he said, you've got to decide. And when you decide, you turn the lights out, you walk out of the room, and this is your new life. So now my definition of success, pretty much it doesn't matter what you have to say about me or anyone's hate mail. And it, even if my children call me up and cuss me out loud off the phone, I now have the skills. I'm shaken by that, right? It hurts. But within minutes, within minutes, I can regain myself and I can step back out into the daylight and I can continue. Whatever it is I have to do, I can continue. I didn't used to have that. So I'm working on a website now called acrossthemiles.org. And it's definitely being developed. It's, it's, it's a newborn baby. There's not much on there. But, you know, by the time your listeners start looking for me, hopefully I've got something going on for them. And uh, you're welcome to share my Facebook uh, link in your description below or whatever you guys do. And okay. it's not, you know, this is another thing before we leave, your audience needs to know you have the absolute right to stand up for who you are. I had a Facebook page recently and I had something like 800 friends on Facebook. They weren't interested in anything to do with homelessness or the content I was trying to put out there. I could take a picture of a fudge brownie and a cup of hot chocolate and say, this is what I had for breakfast. I would get like 400 clicks and likes and all this stuff blowing up my page. I deleted the whole page, Joanne. I dropped it. I deleted my, I deleted that. I deleted my uh, Instagram account at the time because I found out I was trying to please people in order to get a response. The same I was doing in my family, the same I was doing at work. So now my complete radical transformation is I've learned who I am as a person and no one can take that from me. Even if that means a toxic relationship in my family, if it's my children, if it's my mother, we don't speak. I'm not taking their poison. So that's my, that's my success. And I encourage your listeners, stand up for who you are. Be, decide who you want to be and then stand there, stand on it. Good for you. Oh, that's a wonderful story. I really, really appreciate you sharing that. I think everybody's going to get something out of that. So thank you for being here uh, with us today, Wayne. And my so pleasure. Good. And my pleasure as well. And so we are going to go into part two. And before we do, I always want to make sure you know this is by no means a replacement for therapy or any kind of medical attention. If you need it, please always reach out to take care of yourself. Or if you ever are feeling like you want to hurt yourself, there is always somebody standing by at 1-800-273-8255. We'll also put some other resources in podcast part two of Pathway Out of Homelessness that everyone can use. So thank you, one and all, for listening. Please support our podcast by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to show your support. And remember to use and practice the skills we talked about today so that you can feel more joy in your heart and bring it into your life. You can always go to our website, anxietysimplified.net. If you are looking for more information about emotional support animal or to get certified to have a psychiatric service dog today. Bye for now.